Um, I want to thank Rob and Jackson, everyone, for the songs, the um, music this morning. Weren't we blessed? Yes. It was just gorgeous in that song, mate. It's one of my favourites, so thank you. Thank you for singing it. I had an interesting experience this morning. I was going on my Sabbath walk, and I love my Sabbath walk because I just put my Christian music on or a sermon or something like that. This morning I was listening to David Crowder band and I was just listening to, I was just praising God as I'm walking. I'm sure people driving the other way think that I'm crazy, but that's okay. And I was walking along and I was doing my loop and I came up down Camden Valley Way and there was a gentleman walking the other way. He was walking the opposite way towards me. And as we're walking, I like to say hi, mainly because it freaks people out. (laughs) You go, hi, and they go, hi. (laughs) And I was getting ready to go, hey, how you doing? And as I was about to go, hey, he collapsed. And I go, now normally I have that effect on girls. No, I was straight away into first aid mode and um, yeah, I was going, are you okay? And, and he was short of breath and he was struggling. I'm so, I said to him, I, you know, what's your name? You know, danger, response, airway, blah, 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 blah. And we're going there and he goes, I can't, can't breathe. And I said to him, look, I'm going to call an ambulance. Stay on your side and I'll, I'll, I'll be with you. Now, I hate to say it, but there was a thought going through my mind. You know what the the thought was? This is going to make me late for church. I have a responsibility to my parishioners. What's going to happen? The, The worship team are going to be freaking out. There's no pastor. Rob's going to be going, what am I going to preach on? I can think of... There was that quick thought, but, you know, but, but straight away I went, no, I need to be here. We rang an ambulance, they were there in about five minutes. The quickest, unbelievable. And um, he was having a heart attack. I didn't know this, but he was just mentioning, he mentioned to one of the paramedics as they were doing their robs that he'd been trying to get fit, trying to get healthy, because he'd had a heart scare about three months ago. But the heart scare turned into something. He had a heart problem. And I can't believe that this, this morning, right in front of me, and I was thinking to myself, what had happened if he'd had, a, had this episode three or four minutes after, with no one around? And I said, I, I said to myself, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I was there. As little as I could do, I was there. What a sermon illustration. I know, the morning of. And it fits right into what we're talking about, this, this series, The God-Shaped Heart. Oh, yes. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for who you are. And I just, just want to ask that you please bless this time. Bless my words, take my words. Make them yours. Help us to see, Lord, as we open the scriptures, what you want us to see, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been caught, this is an American saying, ever been caught with your hand in the cookie jar? Have you ever been caught in that moment when you're, you know that retribution is about to come? And you're praying for Jesus to come back now. (laughs) Or Lord, just take me. Take me, like Methuselah. No, it wasn't Methuselah, anyway. Enoch, and so on. I was was caught in that situation. I um, I was about 12, I was in grade 6. And my brother, my brother is five years younger than me. So he was obviously about seven. And then my sister was just, just a newborn. So she was about two. And so there's five years between us. Mum and dad didn't plan it. They're just the way it happened. 
Um, my sister thinks that she's older than us and bosses us around ever since she could talk. It was, was I do this? Was I do that? And my response was, who do you think you are? <laughs> Learn your pecking order. But this was a night where my mum and dad are both nurses. I come from a family of nurses, as I, I mentioned. Um, my mum was a midwife. My dad was a psychiatric nurse. My sister became a nurse. I'm the black sheep of the family. I became a pastor. <laughs> and mum, dad was working this night and mum had to go to the shops to pick up something. There was something that was, I can't even remember what it was, but it was urgent. And so she said, was I? Keep an eye. If, if Amy, Amy was asleep, but if Amy wakes up, just, you know, look, just keep your ear out. You're in charge. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm in charge. <laughs> Giddy up. In charge of the cookie jar. Now, I have a spiritual gift that you need to know. I can smell chocolate <laughs> kilometres away. I should be one of those sniffer job dogs at the airport if chocolate was illegal. Okay? Because I can... And I'm thinking, Mum's away. I've got at least a good half an hour. And I know she's hiding some chocolate somewhere. And so I went into her room and I'd seen her put it up there and she had this special chocolate. I thought, this must be really special because Mum hides it. So special chocolate and it was up on a top bench of her cupboard. And so I got a chair, I got up there, I got this block of chocolate. I'm going, oh yeah. Love. Love in a packet. And, and, and so we got into it and we thought, well, I need to take a couple pieces because then she probably won't realise. But then my brother came in. Now I had to share. I said, all right, well, if I have some, you have some, you can't tell mum. You can't say anything. And he went, he went okay, 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 okay. So I had a row, he had a row. We go, oh, we're just loving this. It tasted better because it was wrong. And so we're getting in and we're tasting, we're getting in, we had another row and, and by, the, by the time, but all of a sudden I heard the door latch and mum walked in and she saw us with this packet of now three quarters of an eaten block of chocolate in front of us and she's gone, what have you done? And I looked at her and I said, he did it as well. <laughs> because it's not as bad if someone else is going down with you, is it? It's always not as bad yes. if someone else is going down. That's right. And so hopefully the punishment was. She picked us up and I've gone, it's just chocolate. But she's picked us up, picked Amy up out of the, out of the cot, put us in, all in the car and driven to the hospital. And I'm going, Mum, what are you doing? She goes, we've got to get to the hospital quickly. And she, I said, Mum, it's just chocolate. Are you on some health kick or something? Like, uh, what's, what's going I'm, I'm thinking, and now I'm freaking out, going, I'm sorry, Mum, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it, you know, I, I've done the wrong thing. And she goes, it's all right, it's all right. It wasn't chocolate, they don't have it anymore, but it was a bar of chocolate laxative. Yeah. Yeah. So needless to say, we were all right, but movements in the latter days were rapid ones. <laughs> but I was caught in shame. And my shame, I didn't want to take my shame. I didn't want it. I wanted to. I didn't want. I wanted to share it. If I was going down, I was making sure everyone was going down with me. In John chapter eight. In John chapter eight, we see the story of the woman. This horrible, horrible situation. 
of abuse. And it says in verse 3, the teachers of the law and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and they made her stand before the group. These were teachers of the law. These were teachers, leaders in society that should have been there for women like this. Should have been there for helping people caught in sin. Yet they have taken her in her shame, probably in her nakedness, in everything that she hated about herself. We know from this story that it was her uncle that led her into this situation. Her uncle led her into this, this lifestyle at an early age. And I'm sure as abusers do, he took her and then he told her and she'd see how, how, look, how bad you are, how shameful you are. You don't deserve to be in society, in real life. And now the teachers of the law, God's representatives, have exacerbated that and made it even worse using her as a pawn to try to trick Jesus. You see, they were scared of Jesus. They were scared of Jesus because, one, he fulfilled every prophecy he, f- he fitted every criteria of what the Messiah was meant to be. But he was saying, I'm going to tear down the temple. Your identity is not going to be in the temple anymore. It's going to be in God. He said, I have come for the sinners, for the wretched. I've come for the, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. I have come for, and they could not handle that. It wasn't that he was the Messiah that they hated. It was that he was the Messiah that they did not want. They wanted an earthly king. They wanted a king that was going to break down the Romans, these Gentiles. And as this woman is thrown in front of her in her shame, in her nakedness, The teacher said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Actually, the law of Moses didn't say that. It said any foreigner caught in your camp was to be stoned, along with the man who was with her. Now, what do you say? Now, what do you say? John tells us that they were actually saying this to try to trick Jesus. Jesus just bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. When they they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And again, he stooped down into the ground and started writing. Now, I just want you to get so much in this next text. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left. You see, in the judicial system of this time, when the priests and Pharisees were... Um, I guess, in a court case, and they were to give their judgments, the judgments were meant to be given from youngest to oldest. Do you know why? It was, it was so the older ones wouldn't influence the younger ones' judgments. Which is interesting when we look at Jesus' trial and it was the other way around. Everything about Jesus' trial was wrong. If Jesus was a lawyer, and he knew this, but if he was a lawyer, he could have said, guys, I'm free because of this, 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 and this. 
There were enough, so many things they did wrong, but they needed to send him up. And he went along with it. He went along with it. But at this point, he's writing, and the older ones see their sin in the ground. He didn't embarrass them. He didn't go, well, you know, was a you're overweight and temperance is important. He didn't go, well, you know, you thought lustfully about this when you were 16, like the devil does. He didn't point to each one of them and embarrass them in their lives. He did it in a discreet, loving way to say that basically they had no right to throw any stone. Jesus straightened up, seeing that they'd all gone and went to the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Is there no one here to condemn you? No one, sir, she says. Then neither do I condemn you. But go and sin no more. My virgin says, but now, go now and leave your life of sin. When we think, when I, when I talk about law, when I say the word law, what do you think of? Just law. Don't think spiritually. or, But just law. When I say law, what do you think of? Rules. Cops. Courts, punishment, police, judgment. judgment. Sorry? Jail. Jail. Do confessions later. <laughs> Control. All these things we see when we mention law. What if I said the law of gravity? What do you think of when I say the law of gravity? Do you think of rules and judgment? Something Sorry? No? Something that doesn't change. It's constant? Science? It's natural? Reality? It's just what is? It's helpful? It's not helpful when a big fella like me is trying to walk up a hill. <laughs> At that moment, I'm cursing gravity. But when I go down the other side, it's really good. But gravity is, look, what about the law of motion? What about the law of thermodynamics? What about these these laws? We don't look at these laws as judgment and consequences and punishment, do we? We We look at these laws of natural laws of the universe. They just work. Now, what happens if I try to break the law of gravity? It'll break me. It does, it breaks us. <laughs> what if one day I wake up and go, you know what, I don't like being under the law of gravity. Is it going to change the law? Of... What if we say, you know what, I don't believe in the law of gravity. Does it change? Does it affect me any better or worse? Does it inflict punishment on me for not believing in it? It's just there because it's a universal law. It's actually there, as Rob said, to benefit me. It's there to keep me on planet Earth. Okay? So why is God's law, who made the law of gravity, who made the law of motion... And all these other laws, why is God's law to us any different? Why do we look at God's law like we look at man made law rather than looking at it as a universal law, a universal law of love? And we're going to look at this, guys. We're going to look at this over the next four weeks, the four weeks that I'm preaching. We're going to look at this fact. That the Bible 
Genesis 1 and 2, God created a perfect world with perfect people and in it were the perfect laws and his law was still there. His universal law of love was still there with Adam and Eve because we're built out of love. We're built to be in connection with God. And then chapter 3, what happened? Adam mucked it up. He broke that law. He relied on himself rather than going to God and saying, Eve sinned. And then Genesis chapter 4 to Revelation 22 is about God doing two things. One, showing us his character. Because the moment Adam sinned, there was a wall that got put up between us and God. We could not, even the people who could walk and talk with God on a daily basis, they lost sight. And this wall got put up between God. We couldn't see God face to face anymore. Can you imagine? I just, you know, when you think about Eden, think about the garden. You know, my mind straight away goes to amazing fruits, vegetables, you know, just every fruit tasting like as good as watermelon or mangoes, you know. But can you imagine every afternoon as the day cools, walking with God, talking with God. God, how did you make this? Well, I just spoke it. How did you make the sun? Yeah, I spoke it into existence. How am I breathing? I speak it into existence. Because I love you. Walking with God. But the wall went up and then Satan graffitied on this wall things that we still preach and believe today. Things like God is not love. God is holding something from you. God is keeping something from you. God is a dictator. God is a God of control. God is angry with you. And God's on the other side going, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I love you. I want to be with you. And he shows us through his design law of love. Go to John chapter 5. Just, just back a couple chapters. John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and they say, they said to him, so he said to them, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that they, in them, they possess eternal life. In other words, they were studying the scriptures selfishly. What can I get out of it? What can I get out of the scriptures? But these scriptures... These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come for me, come to me to have life. The scriptures were testifying to God and he was right there in front of them. He was right there in front of them and they could not see it. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. 1 John 4 verse 7 and 8 says this. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from who? God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love amongst us 
that he sent his one and only son into the world that he might live through them. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. God is love. So if we're looking at the character of God and who God is, his foundation, everything that's set on who God's character is, is love. But what does that mean? What does it mean? Because on one side we, 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 we put the laws of man, we put the rules of man, all those things, the rules, the punishment, the justice, the jail, we put all those and we say, oh, well, that must be God. But God says, no, 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 my laws are just design laws of the universe where if you love me, you keep my commandments. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. This was not new. This was way back in the Old Testament given when the Ten Commandments were given. And let me tell you, if you keep God's laws with love, it is way more of a challenge than to just keep them arbitrarily. It's hard to love. It's easy for me to love you guys. But what about that person who cuts me off in traffic? Or what about that person who says vile, angry things against everything I believe in? What about that a person who accuses me of something that is not right? I want you to think about the disciples. Every single one of them were martyrs for Jesus. And at the time Jesus, at the time that they were giving up their lives, they were doing things like praying for their persecutors. That's hard. That's not keeping the law because the law is there to be kept. That's keeping the law because I love them. They were singing hymns. They were loving. God wants us to have his heart. He wants us us to be love. And it's not easy. Because there's this thing inside us that wants for me. There's this thing inside us, each single one of us, that is selfish. But God says, he promises that he's... Actually, go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Listen to this verse. Chapter 36, verse 25. And I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Ezekiel is talking to Israel in prophecy about what Jesus was going to come and do to the early Christian church. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit Put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. I like to put in there, he's going to take out my heart of stone that really struggles with Bronco supporters. No, I'm joking. but (laughs) That struggles with all those people that I struggle with. And I say, God, give me your heart. Give me your heart of of flesh that beats your love through my body so much, so powerfully that it just oozes out. And what did Jesus say? What was the, the, the definition? 
This is how people will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. We need to start here. We need to start now. God's law is a design law of the universe. Next week we're going to talk about, oh sorry, in fortnight's time, we're going to talk more about this and the fact that when we mark up, when we break God's law design universe, yes, there are consequences. But there is always a way back. There is always a way back. Because God is love.